Hi there, everyone. Thanks for watching this video. And thank you to Ben Pink Dandelion for recommending I be part of this Facebook group and this series. I'm really excited to talk about my work. My name is Isabella Rosner, and I am a second year PhD student in London, even though, as you can tell from my accent, I am from the United States. Um, my PhD topic is one that is very close to my heart. It's about Quaker women's art before 1800. And that entails focusing on two time periods, areas, and types of art. I'm looking at 17th century needlework made by Quaker girls in and around London from about 1660 to 1700. And then I am looking at Philadelphia wax and shell work shadow boxes made between approximately 1745 and 1770. And I will show images of both of those things in just a few minutes. Um, this first video will basically be an overview of my research and kind of an explanation as to why I'm undertaking this research. But basically the thesis of all of my work, uh, all of this project is the idea that even though Quakers, including Quaker leaders, were promoting plainness from the very beginning of Quakerism from approximately the 1650s onwards, Quaker women's art up until about 1800 was very much not plain. It was incredibly decorative and was actually, they were actually some of the finest examples of their respective media to come out of both the United Kingdom and the United States. And I'm working to understand why and how that contradiction was allowed, why and how, even though Quakers were so um, devoted to plainness in terms of dress, behavior, language, and outlook, their needle art and their other forms of decorative art were so incredibly opulent. So I'll start off by um, speaking a little bit about how I came to this topic. So a few years ago, I was working at a museum called Colonial Williamsburg, which is in Williamsburg, Virginia, and it's the United States' largest living history museum. It's essentially a seventh, no, an 18th century town, and associated with it is uh, are two museums. And I was working for the uh, curator of textiles, and when there, um, somebody emailed my boss asking about the museum's holdings of shell work. I had never really heard of this. I didn't know anything about it, but she had me pull out the pieces and do some research on them. And I'll show them to you right now. So these, once I can share my screen, yes. Okay, hopefully that is working. Yes, I think it is. Once I, do, 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 do. Sorry, it's taking a long time to share. Yes, no, not that yet, okay. So these are the two shadow boxes that are in Colonial Williamsburg's collection. I call them shadow boxes because they are essentially somewhat large scale wooden boxes. They're kind of like dioramas and they're basically made out of wood with a glass panel in front and they're full of literal shells and pieces of wax. So these two examples are what is in Colonial Williamsburg's collection. Uh, the first was made by Rebecca Evans around 1745. And as you can see, it's kind of like a lovely landscape pastoral scene. And the one on the right, the second one that Colonial Williamsburg has is by Abigail Harrison made in 1766. And it's a lot less full of shells. It has much more wax and it's actually a biblical scene. When I saw these two things, I was immediately very intrigued because they're beautiful, but doing some research on them led me to know and understand that they were actually both made by Quaker women. And I did not understand that because as somebody with a lot of needlework knowledge, I was always led to believe that Quaker women's art was very plain and stylized and unlike anything else. It, I was led to believe that Quaker needlework was like what you see on the screen here. It is this medallion based, oftentimes monochromatic, quite, quite plain style of work. And that did not make sense to me, the difference between these incredibly opulent over the top displays of wax and shell and these very individualized, stylized and often quite plain and almost simplistic types of needlework that I didn't understand how those aesthetic 
choices could be from the same group of people, from the same community. And that led me down a deep rabbit hole of what my current research is, which is focused on things like what you see up on the screen, early needlework by Quakers, and those wax and shell work shadow boxes, which I will talk more about in the next video. There are six examples that survive, and I'm looking at all six. All six were made by Quaker girls and women in Philadelphia, and everything you see on the screen here was also made by Quaker girls and women, mostly girls in this case. This, All of this stuff was made in London, as you can see, at the end of the 17th century. And what I found as I began my research before beginning my PhD is needlework before Ackworth, before around 1800, end of the 18th century, Quaker needlework was incredibly decorative and quite bright, as you can see up on the screen. This all, this needlework is in line with what non-Quakers were making at the same time, but these objects are more decorative, use finer materials, and are more delicately wrought than their non-Quaker counterparts. And I don't, I walked into this project not really understanding how this change came about, why there was a change, why there was that contradiction between plainness and an in intense amount of opulence. I still haven't found any answers, frustratingly, because there is very little information about these objects in official Quaker documentation. It's confusing to me because this piece in the center, which is a work box made in 1683, was made at Shacklewell, which was the first official Quaker girls school founded by George Fox himself. He visited the school often and he was the one who chose the teachers to lead the school. So it's confusing to me why and how this decorative form of Quaker of needlework was happening if the leaders of Quakerism itself were aware of what was being stitched. It's something I have a lot of thoughts about. We can have a discussion about it in the comments. I have lots of ideas about perhaps the connection between uh, London Quaker mercantile connections and the need to train with textile materials. These girls were oftentimes the daughters, sisters, and eventual wives of Quaker men who worked in the textile trades or who were merchants involved in global trade. And I'm wondering if perhaps this fine needlework was a way for them to learn how to use their family's goods, how uh, a way for girls to engage with the materials they would need to be involved with these textile goods for the rest of their lives if this quite decorative needlework was a way for them to become good business people. I don't know. It's hard to say. My entire PhD is just sort of me looking at these objects and trying to understand why that change happened and how this contradiction was allowed and to really point out that contradiction because it hasn't been looked at yet. This material has been uh, largely ignored for a very long time. These objects have not been analyzed in terms of their connection to Quakerism. These objects have been in national collections for nearly a century and people have always thought, oh, what lovely examples of a band sampler or a work box. But only recently, largely thanks to the curator of um, textiles at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge named Carol Humphrey, she has been the person to, to break through this sort of um, lack of care and attention paid to these objects. And she has identified the fact that these objects, many of them, if there are names on these pieces, if they look similar, they were actually made by Quaker girls in and around London. So this research is, is very new, it's very exciting. And these objects have obviously been around for more than 350 years, but only now are people starting to connect the fact that they're, exceptional examples of what they are and that they were actually made by Quaker girls and what that means for Quakerism, for material culture generally, for 17th century girls education. There's a lot to think about there. So that's what I've got for this first video. If you have any questions or anything, talk to me in the comments. I'd love to chat with you all. Thanks for listening.